Twitter two-factor is better than ever. The Tor network is being watched by the FBI, and cars are being hacked at DEF CON. All that and more, this time on ThreatWire. Hello and welcome to this episode of ThreatWire. I'm Shannon Morse and this is your summary of what's threatening security, privacy, and internet freedom. And this week I am joined by Ayaz Akhtar from twit.tv's Tech News Today. Yes, that's where I'm from. It's on the internet. You might have seen the internet. It's where I'm available. I should know that name since I work there. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, anytime. We're happy to have you, and we have plenty of stories to go through, so let's go ahead and get to it. First off is Twitter. So Twitter has seen its portion of hacks from phishing attacks and terribly really bad user passwords, and we've seen many popular Twitter accounts hacked. There was the uh, Associated Press, Burger King got hacked. So therefore, Twitter released two-factor authentication back in May, largely based on SMS messages to your phone. So Twitter has moved on from SMS to a new cryptographic approach on iOS and Android smartphones. Now, since SMSs can be vulnerable when transmitted, Twitter's two-factor will rely on their own application to authenticate a logon. Now, this key will stay on the user's phone instead of being passed between Twitter and the user. So it sounds great. So back in the day, SMS two-factor authentication could be spoofed by creating a page that asked for the user's username and password. This page could also ask for the one-time verification code sent by SMS, and in some cases, the hijacker could actually take control of the phone number the PIN was actually sent to. Now, the new authentication requires two keys, a public and a private key, which is great. Twitter holds the public key, which matched the user's private key stored on their phone. The keys are also 2048-bit RSA encrypted, which is basically the current recommended minimum length for an encrypted key pairing. Now, I did try it on my phone, and it actually works pretty good. This is how it works. You download the Twitter app, you log on if you haven't already done so, and then you go to the Settings tab, the, on the Me tab, and you choose Log On Verification. And you turn this on and store your generated key in a safe place. So this is a generated key that it creates. So in case you lose your phone or maybe it's stolen or something like that, you can still log on to Twitter without having your phone on hand. So keep that in a safe place. And then after that, you can try logging in on your actual browser. You just type in your usual you know, username and password, and it's going to say a login must be verified. So you're going to see a notification on your Twitter phone app that a login request has been set. And if you don't have it actually on, you know, your actually screen on your browser, it, it'll pop up a little notification as well, which is nice. So you click the check mark, and you'll automatically be logged on to your browser. So the good side of this, you can use your Twitter app to verify all of your Twitter accounts. SMS verification could only work for one account, which really sucked for me because I had my Hack5 account and Snubs. Now the bad side, you have to use the Twitter application, voiding use of other apps like Tweetbot. Also, if you currently have SMS authentication turned on, turn it off or the switch will really jank up your login. Now that actually happened to me. I had the SMS notifications turned on, and then I had to type it in, and then I tried to also include login authentication on the app. So then I was trying to log in with the notification from SMS, and then it said the SMS notification was wrong. In reality, the website browser was trying to use the login authentication from the app, but it was also trying to get this SMS one. It was really screwed up. Now, Twitter is working on allowing more than one person access to an account, and they're allowing third-party apps access to the API so they can also verify requests. Yay, I can use Tweetbot. I'm excited for that part. Now, this past Sunday, researchers found a piece of malware that takes advantage of a Firefox security vulnerability to compromise the privacy of users of the Tor network. Mm. The author of the malware is unknown, but security experts believe the FBI or another U.S. government agency may be behind it. The malware's only purpose is to identify a user, and that information is being sent to Reston, Virginia. Now, the malware was found on multiple hosts at Freedom Hosting, a hosting company known to allow child pornography to exist on its servers and has been a target of Anonymous in 2011. Freedom Hosting allows users to create sites that would hide geographic location data and be accessible only by people using the Tor network. The Tor project issued a statement saying, if people want to regain their privacy to avoid using Windows, and disable JavaScript as the malware is written to target Windows machines running Firefox 17 extended support release. 
I do know from experience that it is incredibly easy to get people to switch from Windows over to a Linux mm, box, for example. Easy. Yes, very easy. <laughs> now, last week we asked you how you feel about pornography filters on the internet. Do you believe it is the right of the nation state to uphold morality? Can such proposed filters actually be effective and would you opt into them? I probably wouldn't just based on the fact that it, they might end up blocking something else other than pornography. Now our comment of the week comes from Caduce22. He says, is porn truly immoral? Is it such a big industry because there are so many people worldwide who support it? Morality is a human construct defined by society on how to act towards one another. That being said, would blocking a part of prevalent human culture, even though many would argue otherwise, be counter-democratic? As we are a people not coming into color but turning black and white, it is like the leaders of the world watched Pleasantville backwards and thought it was a good idea. <laughs> Sounds like a philosophy major to me. It really does. think about the morality of it. <laughs> this week we'd like to know what you think of Tor. I've been an avid Tor user in the past, but given the history of skepticism with the network, is it trustworthy? If you do use it, what do you do to keep your network secure from prying eyes? Hmm, that's a good question. Now remember, you can find all the different ways to subscribe over at threatwire.org, and you can give, get involved in our Google Plus community for continued discussion on stories such as these. First off, the Wall Street Journal has reported that the FBI may be developing surveillance tools similar to those of Black Hack Black black hat hackers, such as malware, trojans, and spyware, the most critical of which may be a tool allowing the FBI to remotely turn on mics and record information from Android devices. The FBI has had a long history of surveillance of computers and mobile devices, which we've heard of in the past, with the recent information released about X key score as well as the FBI surveillance. It seems no device is safe from prying eyes. News out of DEF CON 21 to keep you a little bit more paranoid. Security researcher Jake Holcomb of Independent Security Evaluators says that home office and small office Wi-Fi routers are very vulnerable to attack and there isn't a means to protect your network or your digital assets. Now, a report from ISC details 56 new common vulnerabilities and exposures. ISC found that the 10 routers it tested could be taken over once USB storage was attached to the router. ISC contacted several vendors about the flaws. TP-Link fixed all the vulnerabilities, but D-Link did not respond. If you want to be a little safer with your router, do yourself a favor, change the default password, and check for updates on your firmware. I checked that whole list, and apparently mine is on there. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Now at DEF CON 21, car hacking was a really big hit. Security researchers demoed and explained the ability to hack a 2010 Prius and a 2010 Ford Escape. They were able to take control of the steering wheel, the seatbelt, engine, horns, lights going on and off, along with many other parts of the cars. So the goal of the talks was to inform and to make cars safer, not necessarily to cause panic and widespread paranoia even though that'll probably still happen. Yeah, both happened. <laughs> and with all of those stories, again, thank you, Ayaz. It's a pleasure having you here with us in studio again. Well, thanks for having me. This is great. Anytime. And again, I'm Shannon Morse. I'm Ayaz Akhtar. We'll see you on the internet. Bye. Toodle-oo. Toodle-oo. Toodle-oo, y'all. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>